It's the Free Relief Golf Podcast. Thanks to the Blue Wire Hustle program, this is the place where listeners can explore the hidden cost of elite amateur golf. It'll always cost nothing to get some free relief, so let's get on with it, shall we? Hello, and welcome back to the Free Relief Golf Podcast. I'm Freddie, and as always, I hope you're safe and well. This episode is the third of the 2022 season, and this time round we're following a different format because today we are talking about the Lytham Trophy hosted by the Royal Lytham and St Anne's Golf Club. Now at the close of entry, I did not have a low enough handicap to make it into the starting field for the Lytham Trophy, but luckily my friend Colin Edgar did. In a change to our usual podcast format, this episode will be entirely interview based as Colin tells us everything we need to know about the Lytham Trophy and whether or not it is worth playing. Spoiler, it is. There's plenty to cover, so let's get straight into it with just a few facts. The Living Trophy is a 72-hole stroke play event which has a power ranking of 661.0. For context, last year's amateur championship, held at Nairn, had a power ranking of 571.3471. Although, of course, it should be noted that The 2021 amateur field was weaker than normal due to COVID-induced travel restrictions in 2021. Nevertheless, long story short, it's a strong field at the Lytham Trophy 2022, and a win at Lytham goes a long way towards putting any British player straight into Walker Cup squad contention. The tournament is open to male amateur golfers with a handicap of 0.4 or less, but the actual cut-off for entries ended up being around plus 3.5. There's a starting field of 144 players and a cut after 36 holes, which incorporates just the top 40 players and tyres. There's a somewhat steep entry fee, which we cover comprehensively throughout our chat together. But what do you get for this? Well, we're going to find out by asking about our usual areas of concern, golf, food and merchandise. However, before we throw ourselves into this lithium related bliss, Please indulge me in a quick mention of the Free Relief Golf Podcast Patreon platform. As you may already know through this podcast, I'm trying to create a bank of episodes whereby fellow golfers can look up a specific tournament and find out exactly how much it will cost them to play in it. Hopefully this will help people in the future to successfully and efficiently plan their golfing schedules. To achieve this, I'm playing in as many tournaments as I am able to, but guess what? It costs serious money. So the Free Relief Golf Podcast Patreon platform is now officially up and running and anyone looking to support the podcast can do so by signing up to one of the three tiers available and pledging a monetary amount that suits them. Signing up to any tier gets you a shout out on the podcast as a thank you for your belief in this project and this week I'm delighted to shout out my unwavering thanks to my first patron, Zach Bedford. Zach chose to go for the Eagle tier which was very generous of him, but the more modest par and birdie tiers are also available. With all that being said, here's my chat with Colin Edgar. Colin Edgar, welcome to the Free Relief Golf Podcast. It's wonderful to have you here. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Freddie. Thanks for having me here. Hope you're well, too. Yeah, no, it's great to have you here. You sound delighted to be on. Uh, it's great to have a wonderful guest just like you, because you're going to be telling me today all about the Living Trophy, which I was not good enough to get into, which is devastating. But thank you for taking part in this, just to let me know what I was missing out on. It sounds like it was a, a great trip. Um, but a lot of the listeners, no disrespect to you, because I know you are a big deal. Um, that some of the listeners won't know who you are. So please, could you just let them know who are you, what do you do, what are your golfing credentials, why are we listening to you today? Yeah, Freddie, thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro there. Um, a brief intro on me. Um, back in the junior days, I obviously played through, well, not obviously, but I have played through <laughs> in the Renfrewshire, west of coast of Scotland, um, always through junior ranks, uh, Riven in Scotland in the Junior Open back in 2012. Oops, I didn't even know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, played for under-18s and I studied at U- University of Stirling um, for four or five years. What did you study? 
uh, sport studies undergrad and then sport management postgrad. So I had a very good time there. I was lucky to compete in um, various countries through uh, Britain, um, the States, Yale Invitational, uh, out in Dubai, um, Malaga, Prague, etc. I was very lucky to play lots of events. Then following university, I've um, joined the Pressure Champions Professor Chappie team <laughs> at the RNA. Uh, that's been two and a half years now. Where um yeah, part of the stadium team for the Open, the Women's Open. So um yeah, enjoy doing that alongside playing amateur golf events now. So you just you're just competing in these top level events just as a side hustle now. Well, I very much enjoy playing the events and have done so for a few years now. Um, amongst university schedules and national schedules um but yes very much full-time working but enjoy playing as many elite amateur events as i can and it's good fun um so yeah good to good to play with the good players coming up as well yeah well so it's a proper work hard play hard kind of schedule you got going on and <laughs> yes uh yeah logging on freddy between the uh, after the open the women's open, uh, and then countless amateur events you could play in. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sure we'll touch on more of them, but yeah, very much commit to as many as I can. Yeah, and as we were talking off air as well, your hands very much full at the moment with everything that's going on, and it is actually going to impact your amateur golfing schedule this year, which is quite sad. That it's the ongoing joke in the office, isn't it, about the entering open qualifying when you're actually organising it. Yes, um, very good question, Freddie. I get asked a lot, are you going to play open qualifying? The answer usually is no. Um, in the past, it's been it clashes with the east of Scotland, simply the whole event at London Links, which is true. It does clash with that. And that's very much my level. <laughs> so why am I going to open the, enter the open qualifying where I've got the east of Scotland that I can play in for 72 holes for cheaper and um, I may not lose my job over it, so <laughs> that's a good question. Though. Wow, what a point. I've made multiple podcasts on open qualifying, and that has never been an argument that has occurred to me that it does clash with East of Scotland, so maybe I'll just do that instead. It's a big clash, and it's probably a good thing to raise. <laughs> it clashes, clashes with schedules. Well, maybe I'll play East of Scotland this year, and we'll, <laughs> we'll find out. Did I clash this year? Yes, they always clash. No. I've checked the clash, yes. Well... That's good to know. <laughs> Just in time as well. Well, I'd say that's a very comprehensive. I'm glad that everyone hopefully at home now feels like they know you and they should be hanging on your every word as today we talk about. Specifically, and we'll go into other things as well, but specifically the Living Trophy, which you played in, was it two weeks ago? It was, uh, not the last weekend, the weekend before, right? End of April, beginning of May. Yep, yep a couple of weeks ago. And you've never played in the Living Trophy before? Never. Which is a travesty, given that you've played everywhere in the world, but never... Well, you've played in that area. Yeah. You said earlier the uh, off air you played Fairhaven quite a bit. Yeah, I was lucky to play Fairhaven back in 2012 um, as a select for Junior Open, alongside Clara Young, who many of you as may know from playing on tour now. Um, so we <laughs> played together. Great fun. Always said Fairhaven was one of the hardest courses I've ever played. So, um... I've been told I would eat my word when I play Livem, because I baby Livem apparently, but um, I thought Fairhaven was a tough test. And are you eating your words? Could be. Oh, he could be eating his words. Well, if that's not worth staying <laughs> tuned for, then I guess you may as well just <laughs> stop tuning in. He could be eating his words. Right, well, I've never played Fairhaven. I've got a friend who's a member, but they describe it as quite like a short, direct track, but I know Livem is quite the opposite. So... <laughs> We're going to go through this, as regular listeners will understand, we're going to go through this, we're going to tackle the main areas like normal, the golf, the merchandise and the food. Of course, we'll cover the travel and the accommodation. Colin has reliably told me that he's a numbers <laughs> man, so we're going to be putting that to the absolute test. We're going to test it to the limit and we're going to start in this episode with the golf offering that the Living Trophy was going about. Back at the top. We should be saying on the face of it for the entry fee, you can tell us what the entry fee is in a second. Is the Living Trophy worth playing? Is it worth people making a trip? You made the trip to Blackpool from St. Andrews. 
is it worth people making a trip from all over the UK or even obviously it's a global event it's a basically an elite a proper elite amateur event by the world amateur rankings is it worth people traveling to play yeah it's an interesting question um for me i've never played with them i've spectated on it i saw open championships on it um the entry fee um pretty high compared to other amateur events at 110 pounds 110 pounds which, if you, I'm, I'm not here for comparison, but <laughs> we, we are here for comparison. <laughs> you may not be here. <laughs> but if you look at the Lynx Trophy at sixty pound, where you get your couple of practice rounds, um, and access to the old course and range balls, it's quite a lot more. Um, but for me, it's more of that uh, prestige of playing Livam, um, that buzz of being at, at that. It's such a golf course place that Liverpool it's a buzz around the venue. Yeah. It's a great golf course sort of climate there. Yeah. Um so I think in terms of entry fee for me I was willing to pay it because I've not been there. I never played it. I understand it's a historical venue. Great golf course. But um I'd say it's worth it. The whole experience was good, but I'm sure we touch up on the uh, more experiences issues. But um yeah, I'd say it's worth it. Just a bit more, um, yeah, can't remember the question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's fair. I mean, obviously you say about the Lynx Trophy being £60, that is incredible value, isn't it, as an entry fee? I think the Lynx Trophy at £60 pounds is the best value I've seen, considering you get practice rounds on one class golf course plus the old course and guaranteed a round on one of each. Yeah. It's just, there's no better value for money. And if you look at event fees this year, some local sims to do holders are more expensive than that. Yeah, um, not east of Scotland. That's what I'm saying. Not east, <laughs> that's less, just ten pound less, I believe. But other venues, but yeah, I mean, you can't get better than Lynx Trophy. Yeah. So for eleven, yeah, it's more of a yeah. And it, I guess maybe that's a sign of where English amateur golf is at. But perhaps a fair comparison as well as we were looking up earlier, the amateur championship, what the entry fee is. Uh, this year it's at Lytham, isn't it? The amateur championship and uh, Saint Anne's is one of the qualifying rounds yeah. as well. Saint Anne's Old Links. And that's a hundred pounds. So, I guess that's R and A organised, and it's not through uh, Royal Liverpool St Anne's. Yeah, and it's a very good point though, because the Liverpool Trophy being more expensive is by far a weaker field by fact compared to the Lynx Trophy. Yeah. In terms of Liverpool Trophy, never went to Wagger Cup, whereas yeah. Lynx has Wagger Cup, but nearly half the price. So. Yeah, it's, it's a good it, point. It's an interesting one because uh, I. I'm sure in the introduction to this podcast, I'll be saying about the power rankings of the Wagger, which we're like barely understanding. But, um, but it's still a strong event because oh. under, I think under the old alphabetical system, I think Living Trophy was still an A, right? Or it might have been an A or a B, whereas Lynx Trophy and the Amazon Championship are elite. So. Yeah, 100%. For me, going to play Living Trophy, I mean, I work full time now, so going to play this event for me is a great privilege. At the same time, the guys there are there to compete for Walker Cup, GBNI squads, whether that's Scotland, England, that's what they're there for. The top guys are playing there. So it's just great to still be a part of them, yeah. that, that, that atmosphere. So that's what the guys are there for. For me, although I'm there to compete, you know, it's a nice trip away at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And so you got into this field, you said it wasn't a wagger cutoff because... You used to have Wagger right and maybe has it lapsed or not Not to bring up bad memories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no it's just a friend's and bad thing, but it, I mean, it happens. It's, it's reality. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had a Wagger until end of last year, but power rank has changed. You need, you need to play pretty well to keep it nowadays. Even yeah. in Scottish events, you need a, a good top six and a sent to a to keep it. So I, I lost mine, which it, it happens. Interesting. I didn't know about that. that. So is that to keep it every two years is it on a roll, rolling rotation or is it every year that you've got to have a top? Yeah, so uh, without being a complete expert on the topic, <laughs> <laughs> to, to make that uh, clear, but um, nowadays it's a, a one year extended due to COVID, but it's one year. Wow. You have to keep it, and I believe your power to keep your ranking has to be, I think it's a four um, and to gain a wagger rank and to put in perspective, you need a six point five power. Right. Okay. So to keep it in a calendar year, you need four, which in a sort of Scottish event, at your average battle trophy, you're looking at a top six, I believe. Whereas 
the Lynx Trophy, a strong field. Um, well, uh, well Lynx Trophy, our 11 Trophy, sorry. Um, a top sort of 30 might get you that four points. Yeah. To okay. keep it. So good, good, good level golf to keep it still. Yeah. Uh, harder to keep, harder to get. Yeah, so it's, it, it, so that's obviously like a technical explanation, but basically it's active players. There's no more dormant players on the rankings anymore. They've kind of sifted all of those out. You can't just sit on a ranking anymore. You have to be playing and you have to be playing well in order to yeah. still have it. Annually. Annually, essentially. Annually. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, so you got in off handicap and your exact handicap, I mean, what, what are you at the moment? Yeah, when I entered there, uh, plus uh, 3.6. Plus 3.6. So, I just got in, I believe. And you just got in. So... There we go. So even mm-hmm. off my inflated handicap at plus 2.8 last year, I still wouldn't have been able to get a uh, living trophy, even though I guess it was COVID and travel restrictions and all of that. So, okay, that's interesting to know. So let's get into it, Colin. Mm-hmm. That's that's enough of us. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get straight into the golf. So what was the practice round offering? Were they free practice rounds? And how many of them did you get? What days were they on? Let's yep. cover it. Yep. Practice round, redrug my memory. Um, <laughs> you you got one. Um, one major part of it that I remember is they were quite specific. You could only hit one ball, which is fair enough. Okay, a lot of them say that. Course. Did were they enforcing it? Because a lot of them oh, say that. Hundred percent, really. Marshes on course. Oh, that's that's intense. I was in the far green. Um, chipped a wee ball up to the back right pin where the pin wasn't, and I got in trouble. So um, really, <laughs> which is fair enough. Um, not to be a uh, let's be controversial, but I, I got to the team tea and Mister Larry Shepherd, amateur champion, was chipping balls <laughs> about the the fifteenth green, <laughs> and the marshals were there and didn't say a word. But um, not to be controversial, you just you just calling them out. I just saw it. I, I know that it affected me, but I saw it happening. You're just saying facts, just facts. So I got in trouble for pitching a wee ball, but um, I saw that happen, and they were chipping about, but. I completely appreciate that they want to protect the golf course. Golf course is immaculate. One ball at a time. You can putt in the greens with your one ball. Don't chip putt. Don't sort of wedge you. So okay, I, I like that. Good. That's kind of old school. Because I mean, when we've, I mean, you didn't play Craig Miller, but you played Battle as well this year already. But um, I haven't played them both. Uh, I think they had a one ball rule for practice, but there's no one enforcing it. That's a good so point. it's cool that Liven had people out there and they had people willing to marshal out there yeah. to do it. Um, I, I don't mean it's a negative at all. I think it is a positive, and they've got the the volunteers out there doing it. For me, I've never I had never played the course, so I want to have as many putts and balls as I can in the practice. So yeah, you don't just want to have a round at Lytham. You want to actually get to know the course because yeah. you're a good player and you're doing your research. So that, that's interesting. It's not just it's not just your everyday tournament. This is a tournament, like you say, that people are they're grinding for Walker Cup, they're grinding for national positions, yeah. they're grinding for national funding, and every shot counts. So. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of the, the days themselves, um, I'm trying to sort of rejog my memory. I think there was sort of two specific pa- practice round days, maybe one. I need to look back to be honest, but pretty few all on days. I was out late um, on the first round, so I played late the practice round. It was fine for me. Yeah. But they were pretty jam-packed, four balls early on. But yeah, the one ball rule, probably the one thing that stood out. From that that point, but yeah, as a, as a positive at the same time. So were the practice days? So the tournament was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Were the tournament days connected to the practice days, or did you have were the practice days Wednesday, Thursday? I need to look back, but Wednesday, Thursday, maximum. It wasn't the full week. It was right. It may even have been just one day before full on day. I think it may have been Wednesday, Thursday, but yeah. Okay, cool. But not not the full week anyway, for yeah. sure. So those are the practice rounds, and you got kind of standard. You got two guaranteed tournament rounds on Lytham, on Royal Lytham St Anne's, I should say. I shouldn't just abbreviate it because that's disrespectful to the royalness of the club. But um, and then you made if you made the cut, top forty in ties, yeah. And the I don't even know what the field was, but it's substantial. Four, yeah. well, it was one four four, right? So proper tournament. It's not been like the seventy two. I'm saying I'm not saying they're not proper tournaments, but Craig Miller and Battle they're seventy two. But it's a proper international event. You're filling it up. 144 players, but top 14 ties made the cut. That's a tight cut, isn't it? It's the same as a Lynx trophy, but that's tough. Yeah, um, the big, the big, <laughs> they want the big boys in the weekend. For did sure. You, did you make the weekend? We can come on to that. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, that, that's very fair. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of value for money, I think you touched on it. Um, we, we looked at the green fees earlier. So in higher season, Monday to Friday and Sunday, living costs you £245 for a round of golf there. And if you want to play on a Saturday in high season, £305. So it's there if you want to go play it, but it's also not exactly the most accessible. So you're getting it for £110 entry fee. You're already guaranteed three rounds of golf without making the cut by being in the field. So And one of those rounds on a Saturday. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's a good point that's about holiday weekend golf that's an expensive round yeah. you're getting privilege of so we're talking practice round 2, 4, 5 you get 2 rounds on a Sunday if you make the cut right yeah. so that's 4.90 so that's 7.35 plus a round on a Saturday so that's over a thousand pounds worth of gold green fees in green fees and you get it for 110 so maybe we were half to slate it for it's just 110 pound entry fee but I guess that's just by the price they charge so it doesn't make it right it's just facts we're only here to talk facts you've got to respect the uh, prestige at the same time so uh, yes absolutely I'm respecting it more and more having never well never properly been there we'll get onto that but um, I have walked through a public footpath that goes through the course so I've basically played it yeah, that footpath could be marshaled better. I mean, it plays balls over them. <laughs> not, not like there's any of the love trophy at all here. <laughs> you can't have marshes everywhere, but there's a lot of school kids walking to and from that path during the championship. <laughs> it's exactly like uh, it's exactly like Granny Clark's wind uh, on the old course at St Andrews. Can we just get two marshals, one on either side, please? Because having one marshal on one side does not achieve anything. As part of the experience, though, it's unique, it's special. People want to be there. There's a buzz there. It's yeah. what you want in the end. Same, same, True. Same. I also love unique, irritating experiences. <laughs> um, so you, you already said the course is in great condition. How do you define that? So you'd expect the greens to be pure at an event like this. In terms of the bunkers, so what I've heard about Lytham as a course is that the bunkering is immense. They're deep. They're impossible to miss. You're going to be in one eventually. Was the sand nice? Like, is that too nerdy a question? No. no, no. What, what else about the condition was highlighted it to you as a prestige event? Uh, no, I work backwards there. I think the sand isn't a nerdy question. Um, the ball came out quite hot, actually. Okay. Quite, quite not not a lot of sand. Good, good sand, but it came out hot. Right. In comparison to playing the likes of Andrews, where there's a, a lot more sand. Um. The course themselves from T fairway greens bunkers immaculate breaks out the bunkers a good twenty yards from the bunkers all the time. They keep them out of the bunkers. Okay. And they have a lot of volunteers looking after that as well. So if you put it too close they they moved it. Just a great touch. Um I love that the volunteers are so hands on that they've oh. got so many of them. It seems like I love events where the members are proper, you know, maybe they're dressed up jacket and tie, but where people are properly proud to show off their course and, you know, get involved. Yeah, that's a good point as well. I mean, they do have the jacket and ties on course as well. Uh, when they speak <laughs> to you, you, li- you listen. Yeah. Because they've been there longer than you've been there. Yeah. And they have the respect, the sort of le- legacy of the course. Um, so that aspect was special. I think the condition was, to be honest, at that time of year, where you're looking, where we enter in April, yeah. kind of coming to me, just immaculate. I mean, good, good tees, fairways pure. The rough was maybe down more than summer. Yeah. An open championship, it'd be thicker, really hard. But in terms of greens, fairways, bunkers, semi, tees, tee markers, just immaculate. You can't get any better. It was just perfect. So the rough was down. As a result of that, the play was in three balls, right? So I don't know what it was after the cut, whether it was twoes or threes. Yeah, but I don't know that either. But, but, <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> um, but how was the pace of play? Was it okay, given that the rough was down? The course is tough, right? And the scoring is tough. So was it five-hour rounds, or are we talking a bit less than that? Yeah, I mean, uh, not held up, but you're talking sort of four and a half hours. I mean... It's a tough, it's a tough par seventy yeah. off the off the championship tees. Four and a half is pretty fair. 
Um, yeah, pace of play was fine. Refs were on top of you. Love that. Which you like. Sometimes it's not great. Sometimes it is good when it's needed. Yeah. So, I mean, pace of play was fine. Four and a half hours, tough golf course, part seven there. Yeah. For your viewers that have played 11, they'll understand or watch the open there. Everyone's probably saw the open there at some point, hopefully. Yeah. Just a, a great venue. Realize it's, I've never been there before. I've watched golf on it, but it was truly really good to play and tough yeah. up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll get onto that right now because just a few comments on the layout of Lytham. I'm guessing it, it it's an open course. It's a proper setup. I'm guessing every hole is a stern test. It's not. There's no gifts of short par fours, drives and flicks, gimme par fives. It sounds like you got to work for every shot. Is that a fair assessment? A hundred percent. I mean, working backwards again. The first gimme par four I thought I had was a sixteen hole, <laughs> where I burst a drive into the wind at seventy six of the flag, which was perched sort of on the front of the green. Uh, we went from the left, and I the first time I had a wedge in my hand from any par three, par four, par five, technically in the regulation, and I and that's a nice wedge in there. Probably pitched about seventy two, pitched up, stopped, about four foot left of the pin. I was like, okay, first round, get up here, get back to three over. It's pretty good at eleven. Yeah. As I put my wedge in the bag, the ball disappeared. I was like. <clears throat> <laughs> This isn't happening, is it? Down to the left. Still going. Big bunker. Right in the big bunker. It was a, a sucker flag in the end, which looked like a simple flag. Yeah. Before I knew it, hitting a wedge into the green, I was in this bunker, up the lip, trying to hit onto this tight pin. Could not believe it, to be honest. But I'm <laughs> devastated. I, I, yeah, I mean, I've not been there. I'm quite an accepting golfer, but it's the only time I've had a wedge in my hand. Yeah. The rest of the course, you're hitting, you know, four irons, five irons, par fives, 600 yard holes, like down the stretch, keeping between bunkers, laying up, still hitting nine, eight irons in for your third shot. Yeah. The, the first time all day, I had under 120 or 30 or 40 yard shot in a green and it ran in this big bunker. And I was like, I was doing double in the face here. Yeah. But that's, that's, I think that's living. Yeah. That's the beauty. It's a, Championship venue as a proper golf course. The bunker is exceptional, yeah. and it's just a good. It's just a hard golf course. And I think I mean that's a great story. So that speaks something to the setup as well. Were they trying to make an example of players? Was every were all the flags on every green stuck in corners that were sucker pins, pretty much, and you had to play away from them, and it was two putt pars, or were they? giving you some middles of the greens. I don't really know how sloped the greens are as well, how many pin locations they'd had. Yeah. But. yeah. I was surprised at how sloped the greens were for how demanding the golf course is for a par 70. Yeah. That's a long par 70. You know, you're talking par 4, you rarely hit one that's under 480. Yeah. Par 3 is under 200, par 5 is under 600. They don't come often. But the greens were slopey, very slopey. And the pins, I could get the pin sheets so out. Every single one was four from the left or four from the right. <laughs> Maybe one central, but there's a big mound there. They were tough. They can. They were tough. Yeah. So they're just trying to properly examine the players, and I guess the scoring showed that because I know John Goff won it. He didn't break par. I think he was level par. The only player there won it. Yeah. One. I think he may have been over par when he won it, but um, I think the cut for. Not that windy conditions. The wee breeze, not much. We wee drizzle, not much again. Soft-ish golf course for living. Green's a bit softer. Fairway's pretty fiery still, so tough. I think it was plus seven or eight. Yeah, it might it might even been nine, you know. Maybe nine. It might even have been nine. I think some nines might have gone in from Maybe I try to cover myself on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, like, either way, that tells you... That tells me and everything. that's the top the top boys in the amateur game who can hit the ball very well. So it was um that was a staring test for sure. And that's the top forty of hundred and forty four as well. That is the top it's not just a half half the field getting yeah, the cut. That no, is that's... the top players on the week. I did go down the leaderboard and saw some scores and you know, you look at anything, oh, I could have done better than that, I could have done better. 
you just don't see the scores, you just, don't see the course. And it's very well put. I'm, I'm, I remember looking back in the day, Marco Penn, who's a great golfer, we saw him about. And I remember looking back when did they live him? It's like plus twenty four front nine, <laughs> plus twenty four. <laughs> That's not true, but um, we might come on to this. But I've heard a, a lot of these players who's won on tour played live him trophy. And they've classed Livam as the hardest golf course on the planet, especially the front nine on the, the normal wind. Right. Hardest front nine on the planet. And that's with the sixth hole going to a par five to a par four. And that's not really a change there, but. Yeah. What, what blows my mind with that? I mean, you've called out Marco Penge now as well as Led Shepherd, so I'm loving this. But, um, so this is where Georgia Hall won her open, right? The ladies mm-hmm. open. I saw that, yes, but you'll know probably more than me, sorry. And I'm, you know, I'm going to look up the winning score. But yeah, we've just gone away and checked it out. So Georgia Hall won was 17 under, the par 72. So even if you made that a par 70 for the ladies when she won it there in 2018, mm-hmm. that's nine under. So that's still exceptional scoring even for that. But And it was that was baked out summer as well, wasn't it? So... I don't know how that would make it easier because the green surely wouldn't hold. I think that's incredible because eleven has got a lot of greens raised that you know they're surrounded by bunkers. So I mean that that score total of shots is remarkable. Yeah, because we played in soft-ish conditions compared to what it could be. That's pretty impressive. It's, it's pretty unbelievable <laughs> to be honest. I don't know how. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's maybe. maybe. Maybe professional golfers are just better. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Shout out the Women's Open. <laughs> AIG Women's Open champion as well back in the past uh, some year. But, uh, at Woburn, I believe it was. Oh. That's, in, that, that's at Livam. Any scoring under that, what's that? 70 times four um, to... To eighty. Yeah. That's under that she scored. It's just impressive scoring total. It, it really is. Yeah. Because the bunker at that golf course is pretty remarkable, I think. Fair be angry and say. <clears throat> well, so before we before we move on from the course entirely, mm-hmm. the, what is it about the bunkering that makes it special? Why does everyone talk about it? Yeah, I think um, even from the first hole, you stand up there, sort of 200 to 10 yard bar free into the wind off the right from this sort of predominant wind. And it's probably the easiest hole in the front nine. <laughs> and it's surrounded by nine big bunkers, <laughs> which you hope you can get out of. But I think from the tee, from just speaking, I've only played from the championship tee, but a lot of the holes you've got the sort of right hand bunkers by the railway line in the first three holes and the left hand bunkers. So you're, you try to get past the right hand bunkers while staying short left hand bunkers on the predominant wind. Yeah. Um, then you still got a long area into the green, sorry about big bunkers. Then you turn back. I think the bunker and looking through the front nine, every single hole off the tee, you need to think about it. Yeah. Are you going to take it on? Are you going to lay back? How much do you have in? I'm having a four iron in. I've still got these bunkers to contend with from the green. I think the bunker and the whole golf course. It's just it's hard to describe. It's just it's a great design. The ninth hole, which is a bit of a one seventy par three, um, it, it should be off the right, and you put still eight or nine bunkers around there. If you miss the target, you're in a deep bunker, and you hope you get a lie. So it's pretty special the bunker, and that's just a par three. The par four you've got off the tee, you've got to get in with them. So I think everything's in play. You've got a lot of golf, but you two lots of bunkers. Yeah, but here you've got left side, the right side, you need me to carry, you need to see short of them. So they'll come into play for sure. That's such a great summary. I uh, maybe <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to go play at some point, but maybe once they sort the bunkers out. <laughs> Perhaps. Um great summary of the course. So let's get into more about what you actually get as a competitor in the Living Trophy. What are they offering you? So practice area. What what is the practice area set up? Is there a chipping green? Is there a good putting green? What's, is there a driving range? Is there a driving range nearby? If not, um, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, so I think the the practice area is uh, pretty positive. Large putting green near the first tee. Lots of holes on it. That's good. I check that box. 
Short game area, pretty good fenced off, picket fence, really smart, almost like a major field picket, yeah. sort of three foot picket fence around it. Yeah. Bunkers, few pins, slopes, tight lies, semi. Great. All right. So here's the thing about picket fences. Like, what's the point? Is it just stopping animals? But if it's three foot, could the animals not just jump? <laughs> <laughs> a great question. I mean, three foot picket fence definitely stop the animals. Look smart. Could jump it. Six foot picket fence, from my experience in championship, we use that for more splitting the public from back house. That's a different story, though. There we go. So yeah, so maybe six more foot six taller. foot. Just you know, more, I think six foot is not as nice. So for we chicken because it's quite quite enclosed, then you can. I mean, you could hop over it yourself from your if you're going to chip there for a three foot. I think the three foot looks smart, quite uniform. Fair enough. Tidy. Okay. Just, just ask it. Just ask me questions that need addressed. <laughs> And the driving range? The driving range itself, um, pretty good. I mean, a long walk, um, which I don't want to speak too much on in case they didn't read the description of the competitors, but <laughs> it was about a, a three, four hundred yard walk from the short game area. Um, volunteers were great. Rope lines were good for each round. They had it from the front, move it back each five days so they never ran out of, of tea space, essentially. So that was pretty good. Uh, the balls themselves were uh, probably pretty average, just like a range ball, quite hard. Did it have rank rock. written on it? I uh, can't remember, but it wasn't a, a soft ball. It was just a, <laughs> a range sort of ball. <laughs> That's surprising, given they've gone to like such length with all the details and then they've just got random range balls. Yeah, I guess it's good, an interesting topic if they've got more premium range balls in their sort of stock or inventory. Would they put them out? Would it be worth considering that in the future for these golfers? And it's probably quite important to know some of these golfers could be the next big thing. They could play Ryder Cup, so probably there's good player. Yeah, yeah. You've got examples that you could go through for years. So I think expensive, but it's quite a premium touch, and it's a good touch if you have these softballs. Good golfers. I'm not saying from your less average golfers, but they want to chip and pop with the ball they're using. And you can use that to chip in the area of fine, but on the range, hitting rock hard balls, you know, you're turning your warm up as a warm up at the end of the day. Yep. But you might want to practice after your round with the, the sort of right ball. I'm not saying you should have your, where is it, a major champion after your tight list, your strixings, your. Your everything, Callaways, all the different types of balls. I'm not saying that, but maybe one sort of soft premium ball. Yeah. Good touch. Well, it's certainly, uh, I said this to your fair, the Royal St. George's Royal Sink Ports when I played their South East England Lynx last year. Even they've got probably one X's on the range, or they've got a form of like title list, even if it's a practice or an ABX hmm. or something like that. They, they, it's just a name on there, but it's a golf ball. It's not just a range ball that's like one yeah. piece. I don't know about golf ball technology, but you know, like, it's, yeah. like you say, it's not a rock. Yeah. So, and yeah. the crucial question with the range was, did they charge you for them? Or was that all in with the entry fee? No, yeah, that was all in, which was very good. And the range was long enough so you could hit all clubs. So, that sure. was good. Cool and did project. they give you set buckets of balls or you had to, you could just take as many as you wanted? As many as you want. So, yeah, it's pretty good. Good. Very good. Decent and bone of contention. This comes up every single week now, and I'm really keeping a, a, a track of it because yardage books is just the bane of my existence right now. Some people may say it's a small cost, especially with the rise of the, co- the rise in the cost of living is going through the roof, and I don't want to be paying more for yardage books. But what was the deal with yardage books? There, what price are we talking about? How good were the books? Yeah, so the books. One thing I definitely purchased because I've not been there. I've watched it, but with the wind, etc., on that course and the yard, you have you just have to know it. Um, it was nine pound. Nine pound. Which that's I, steep. I I don't know if it's steep or not because in the past I paid five six pound, but maybe not bought a yard book in a while. I've a lot of courses that I know, so I just go and play them. But I think nine pound was quite steep. Maybe that was my merch purchase, but um... <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it was definitely steep because I think yeah, Royal St George's or St Paul's it was eight or nine pound. So it seems to me, I think I joked in that episode. Go back check it out if you haven't listened to it. 
um, I joke that it's a royal tax. When you go to a royal golf club, suddenly there's royal taxes on absolutely everything. But nine pounds. And was it just a standard yardage book? Yeah, I mean, it's a good point because they're they're sort of cost price to purchase that compared to annual like, golf course. It's going to be the same, so it's uh, their markups a lot more. Not getting into that. But <laughs> <laughs> not getting into yeah, that. I, I, I. All right, that's enough about the yardage. It's fine, but yeah, not like just fine. for me nine pound though. I mean, I was quite happy to pay that because it was like. I need it for this tournament. Could they include that in the entry fee and just boost it up a wee bit to their cost price for the RG book? Put that in. That's a nice pair because you're like, oh, I've got my book, got my tag, my yard. It's quite a nice touch if you yeah. had that involved. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, the tag there, so we're on to the merchandise now. We played golf today. Yes. You had your bag tag on there. It had your name. It had the logo. It looked very smart. It was massive for a start. <laughs> I, I think I remarked it was obnoxiously massive. Nothing, yeah. no comment on you. Maybe Biggest, just a comment on Lytham. But, um, biggest thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's not true. So they uh, they gave you the bag tag. Any other merch? Were there any tea pegs or any like gift pouches that they gave you on entry or... No, the entry was pretty informal, to be fair. Um, just a, just a drug of memory. It was really just uh, on the day. It wasn't a, a clubhouse entry. It was a tent sent up. You got there, got your bag tag. It wasn't a pitchfork or tees or a ball marker. It was just bag tag. Bag tag, local rules, scorecard. Yeah. Oh, okay, so just like kind of basic stuff. Yeah, yeah, just every every ten and they, and they starter and they didn't let you in the clubhouse. Or were you allowed in the clubhouse? Or uh, yeah, so that wasn't the clubhouse. That aspect, um, we went to we sort of holding room for the sort of score entry after the rounds. You could go in the clubhouse, but it was quite smart in terms of shoes, jacket and tie. dressing. You we wouldn't have jacket and tie, but you couldn't get in with your sort of golf shoes or trainers uh, sort of smart shoes and yeah. tire that's um, fair enough which it's very fair for the clubhouse and probably should have packed more for that but for me I, I was just there to play yeah, and go well. so I didn't quite pack all that sort of attire for the sort of four or five day trip yeah that's fair enough maybe next time maybe next mm-hmm. time yeah and uh, in terms of food now this is something I always keep an eye on just because again like I said earlier it might just be a nice perk if it if it happens, any free water out there? Any bananas on first tees or temp tees or any sort of setup like that? Or was it purely kind of get out there, play a golf, come back? Yeah. Um, so they gave us water at the first tee. That's all right. But um, bottled plastic water. But um, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no cans, <laughs> no cans, no cans. Nothing on course. Oh, right, um, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're all about sustainability, carbon <laughs> net zero, so the, the plastic offended me a wee bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I tipped it into my flask of water that oh, my refillable. There we go. Very sustainable. Appreciate that. Nothing on course, though. I mean, just like get on with it. The only thing on course was the life scoring, which is a very positive event, I'd say. The first round, I live score in every three holes, which was good. The next day, it was after 18 holes. After the cut, they had it again. But, I mean, the live scoring, getting the volunteers out there, marshalling, pushing you on, getting your scores. You know, it's, um, I mean, family, friends, everyone, they like to see live scoring. Even at these amateur events, not even 18 hole scores, they do enjoy three, six nine holes I think that's a big yeah for sure positive when you get this sort of three hole scoring each time it's a good positive let's keep track it's fun or, or you like get it. or you get something like uh, Scottish Amateur last year with the qualifying where you're meant to, well there's a leaderboard attached to as you stick in your score each yeah. hole and then that's a hole by hole thing and that, that's almost even better if it wasn't on the Scottish Golf app that's another story <laughs> nah yeah the nah, app <laughs> we don't need to go into that <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah that's great <laughs> I think that is a good point for the whole by whole no the whole by whole is great <laughs> and people like that they don't want to be like twiddling their thumbs like oh how is he getting on yeah after five hours because people are 
genuinely interested and I think that genuine interest is quite important because we should like target the audience that like, you want them to be absorbed in these yeah. events amateur for sure whatever they are so it's a great positive and I know the Lemon Trophy um, had it the round one Round two didn't have live scoring for every three holes. Um, what was it? I'm not as close to it to know the the reason. It was a Saturday, so maybe people were busy. Um, but they had it after eighteen holes, so people would see it. But and that sort of day for me, that like that was the day you want live scoring. You would cut mark. Yeah, exactly. You've That's got people is. playing. People want to know. Oh, okay, okay, I'm here. If he drops out. Seven people be getting the cut. Like people want to know that. Yeah, exactly. So that that was that was the point for me. I thought. Or if Conor Graham's tearing it up like he was. Yeah, I mean, fifteen year old trying to win the Living Trophy. Yeah, uh, Conor, I think came second total. Great achievement. People want to know this stuff. Like people, there's a great market for amateur golf. Like that actually, really is. People are interested. I know Golf Bible on Twitter. Yeah, that's why he's a lot. Mark Healy's a legend. Yeah. Yeah. Who does the golf? Is he the, yeah. You you probably know him best, but that's who. If I want to see what's going on, and I don't use Twitter much. I'm not very active, but that's why I see the scoring. So the live scoring there, I think the free will scoring on the cut day would be pretty cool as well. Yeah, I wonder why they didn't do that. Interesting. Yeah, uh, I I don't know. Yeah, I mean it was a Saturday. Maybe people were busy. Maybe they wanted people to. Hang up, hang around after a round to see if they made the cut on the scoreboard as an option. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, just I, I don't know a way of hooking people into the clubhouse. <laughs> but um, yeah, some very great and valid points there. And I guess <coughs> now, but I guess now we'll talk about some overall costs rather than just the tournament offering itself. So we we're just talking about food in terms of well. We'll talk about travel, food, and accommodation. And to start with travel, so how did you get to Blackpool from St. Andrews? Yeah, so for me, I came from St. Andrews. I went to my parents near Trin and Darville, um, worked there for the day. And then me and my dad uh, drove from Darville down to St. Anne's for me. Uh, Mr. Dean Robertson, the... Uh, High performance coach at the uh, St. Uh, Sterling University. Mr. Dean Robertson, I'm glad uh, you've got the respect for him. Yeah, so um, the three of us stayed in our apartment down in St. Anne's for the uh, the four nights, which was like which was good. Yeah, so you said you so you stayed in an apartment through Booking dot com. Okay, yeah. so I've, I've never tried that option. Normally, when I do this, I kind of look at Premier Inn prices, Travelodge prices, but. Is this how you normally do it for the tournaments you've been to? Yeah, I think for me, um, when we've been away, so we were lucky at the uni that Dean usually booked the apartments, etc. But whenever I've been away, Scottish amateurs or Scottish stroke plays away from home, we do try and book apartments. It's just it's my preference, to be fair. So that sort of apartment we can book... Um, we have a kitchen, we've got our own bedrooms, living rooms, so you can cook your meals. So that, that's the main reason. massive, isn't it? It's, it that's what I'm realising is it's an absolute game changer. You get cheaper places maybe at a Premier Inn, but then you've got no kitchen. Yeah, I think the kitchen is key. So even looking at living, the Premier Inn for the four nights was probably more expensive. I mean, it's not having a kitchen and your living space, so you've got more air to move about. You can... Could, you can have your own dining space and your own bedroom, so yeah. it's quite good actually. Makes a huge difference. And that, um, so you stayed in Lytham, so yeah. in, in Lytham, and you said it was four nights, and it was four ninety total. Yeah, uh, yeah, four ninety. Sorry, this was all off air, so <laughs> I've just pulled these numbers no, yeah, out. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, four ninety for the four nights um, between the three people. So that came out to about one hundred sixty three. Was your share of it? Um. To go with, to go with the travel you already did, and that travel with in the car was about how many tanks of petrol do you say? Yeah, probably um, one and a half from Darrell. Um, sorry about the accent there, but <laughs> I put that <laughs> from that? there. So, yeah, I mean, maybe a hundred pounds between two. Yeah, yeah. So it's oh. it's plenty. It's it's a journey, isn't it? It's a bit of a trek. 
Like it's just yeah. it's all motorway, but yeah, I probably got a wee bit extra from St Andrews to go there as well. So yeah, a bit more petrol. So the petrol does add up like one forty ish from yeah. the whole trip essentially. That's pretty substantial, isn't it? And then, so we've already said that you've got the kitchen. So in terms of food, what did you do for the week? Were you just there for four nights? Yeah, four nights. So the first night we got there quite late just from work and stuff. So we didn't eat that night, really. We just met before I got yeah. there. We played. So then I cooked quite a bulk, oh, I had a nice meal. <laughs> to her, so I like pasta with garlic dish. I said you were a good night. chef. Yes. Go down the grapevine. I enjoy cooking <laughs> at times. So, um, yeah, I cooked for the three of us. Um, the second night, I went out for Chinese. Um, then the third night, um, cooked again. But, yeah, I mean, from the cooking, you get, we had our, our breakfast and lunch from from the kitchen and the flat to go out, so we weren't spending there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's quite cost-effective to an apartment, and you eat pretty well doing it, to be fair. It was quite good value yeah exactly and that's what this podcast is all about it's all about finding the good value Mm -hmm. cost in all these events which is sometimes very hard when they cost 110 entry but it's fine (laughs) Uh, so those are the main costs and we'll come back to those and tally those up in a second to see how much the living trophy actually costs just some final comments so regular listeners will know that i normally do an overall experience rating for every event we cover 11 different areas out of five we give them a total not able to do that this week because I didn't play the Living Trophy in case you couldn't tell. That's why Colin's here. There's some other areas which we actually haven't covered yet in terms of, and let, let's just ask you right now. So you kind of touched on the weather. Normally that's a consideration. But how was the general hospitality at Royal Living the St. Anne's? Were, you, were they very welcoming? You said all the marshals were out there and they were kind of on your case and guiding you around but I guess they were respectful about it was it were you, were you welcome to roll in yeah 100% I mean we were firm but welcoming firm but welcoming I don't know what I the scores like are <laughs> the scores out of five here or... uh, well, well you, you can give it whatever you want out of five really I'm not going to be able to get a total but... uh, <laughs> no they were they were good they were firm but welcoming love it and in terms of Overall organisation and communication, whether, was it all by email? Did they just stick stuff on a website? Was it pretty efficient how they did it? Yeah, I mean, they, they were pretty articulate in their emails. They were quite concise. Very, everything was there. Yeah. It's one of the things when you run a major event or amateur event, people need to read the information. They've got them there. They had it all there. So it was very good. So there were no uh, fallouts like a Kral in the Battle Trophy where there was a thing that said that no distance measuring devices was allowed <laughs> to no, be allowed in the I tournament. Think, I think that got wrapped up just before the tournament. <laughs> but uh, that stressed me out a wee bit as well. But I, I, I hear a point because I saw that. I was like, I need, your practice, I need you to get my distance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hard, but yeah. I need to start that, pacing it out from yeah, bushes. <laughs> that was good to clarify that because the pace of play for two rounds in one day would not have suited me. Yeah. <laughs> I think but yeah, they were good. It was slow enough with lasers. <laughs> okay, well, that's good to hear. So it sounds like it was pretty organized. It was pretty welcoming. Firm, but welcoming. I like that. <laughs> and the weather was all right as well. It was pretty like drizzly, but not much wind. Yeah. Just a good standard weekend of golf. Yeah. A bit much wind in my tea time, but we won't complain about that in the afternoon. <laughs> You're perfect. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's just wrap all these costs then. So the entry, as we've gone on about, is £110. Probably one of the most expensive events we'll be playing this year, other than I'll be playing Open Qualify for 150 entry. But you could argue that's a bit of a professional entry as well, so... You know, in terms of amateur events, 110, you're not going to get more expensive than that. But it sounds like you get the value for the golf at least. Um, your tank of petrol, we're looking between 80 to 100 pounds, one and a half to two tanks of petrol. The accommodation, 490, four nights so between three of you. I think that's, that's a steal, isn't it, really? When you're looking at 40 pounds a night per person, you're not getting much better than that out there. That's pretty cost effective, I'd say, if you're in yourself. Because for me, if I'm going myself, I'm paying that total on my own for four yeah, nights. So. Exactly, yeah. It pays to have friends. <laughs> well, <laughs> Not all of us have that luxury. But <laughs> father and a good golf court. Well, he's a very nice guy. So <laughs> <the> jungle, so. <laughs> 
that will be the uh, headline of the <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> and in terms of the food, you said about the Chinese you had out, and you had the big shop from Tesco. There are other there are other supermarkets available, um, especially now the club car prices have come in and they're mugging everyone off. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So that's about six pound for the big shop total, and then there's your chunk of that. We'll guesstimate the Chinese cost. So overall, for the Living Trophy, do you want to hear how much it costs you to play the Living Trophy? I love to hear it. Thanks to the calculator, it's between, it's a range, between £353 to £363 for your four nights and your golf. That That's a pretty good total because if you're to look at that out with share with two others, it could be a lot more. Yes. That's probably that's like a budget cost. <laughs> that's that's a positive way of looking at it. So and that's a good point. So that was your cost, but there are more expensive ways of doing it and probably, probably not many cheaper ways of doing it. No. That that was quite uh for me I might do one or two events a week that are more expensive where I have to pay accommodation. Yeah. But getting a, an apartment with a kitchen like that, that was that's pretty that's a that was quite a good deal. Yeah. It sounds like it as well. So, so we've, we're getting to the end of it now. We've covered all the costs. We've covered all the key points. Between three hundred fifty, three hundred sixty pounds to play the Living Trophy. We asked you at the beginning, is the Living Trophy worth playing? Of course, it is for the prestige. Given that number, given that range of numbers, is the Living Trophy worth people travelling to to play from the UK or further afield? I mean, we've said there's Europeans in the field here. They're going to have to pay for flights on top of that as well. The travel's more expensive. They're looking probably closer to 500 to 600 pounds once you incorporate the travel and the food. What do you reckon? Is the Living Trophy worth playing for that amount of money? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'd say 100%. I think... <sighs> You've got major events in professional golf and major events in amateur golf on the UK side of things. You've got your Lemon Trophy, your amateur, your Lynx Trophy. Maybe your Carrot Nail Stroke play in there. <laughs> your Brab is in England, so five perhaps. But yeah. um, I think for Lemon 100%, you've got guys coming over. They're after a guy from Sweden, uh, Svante, great guy, good golfer, young boy, but a very good player. Who gets supported to play? So I guess a question to people that aren't as supported though, is it worth it? I'd say so. For me, maybe different values. I got to talk with my dad, my golf coach. Great conversations, great evenings. We 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 worked hard to prepare. We played. So um, I think the event itself is a pretty special place in the world to go to. Yeah. Love and Anne's to experience without the golf course, but then with that on top, I say it's hundred percent. You go play it if you can. You would pay that fee. That's a strong recommendation, and it, so it's just it's money for great memories, and that, that's a really good point as well about being unsupported or supported by golf federation. The guys who haven't got to worry so much about the cost, well, they've got to worry about the cost, but they just they've got the funding behind them to do it as well. So. I haven't got to worry as much, but unsupported players, you heard it here first, you should be playing it. It's one of the major championships of amateur golf, especially in the UK. With no more final comments about Lytham, Colin, thank you very much for coming on the show. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this isn't the last time you come on here, because I'm sure there'll be plenty of other events you play, which I won't have access to in the near future. But you're meant to disagree at that point. <laughs> of course <laughs> but thanks for coming on and yeah hope to see you soon good luck with the rest of the season good luck with the Open thanks Freddy hopefully I'll join you soon on the Free Leaf podcast that's <laughs> <laughs> great you're more than welcome So that was every practical thing you needed to know about the 2022 Lytham Trophy hosted by the Royal Lytham and St Anne's Golf Club. Before I go on, I should definitely once again thank Colin Edgar for his time and valuable input and insight into this particular podcast episode. I think you'll agree. He spoke very well, much like the RNA professional that he is, and 
he certainly came up with a couple of points which I hadn't even considered in this whole series of podcasts I've been doing for the last year or so. So thank you, Colin, for those. And to everyone here who's just just showing up to the Free Relief Golf Podcast to listen to Colin's dulcet tones, even if this is just dropping by, thank you very much for dropping by. I, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. If there is anything major that I've missed out or that you would like to have heard or that would be useful for your future planning or even my future planning for events, then get in touch with the podcast. We're on Instagram, we're on YouTube as the Free Relief Golf Podcast, so follow and subscribe for all those future episode updates. And you can always get in touch with me personally at freddylawrence.golf at gmail.com. I'd love to hear any feedback you have to make future episodes specific to what you'd like to hear. Finally, one more shout out to my newly launched bonus subscription podcast series to follow through. You can subscribe to the series through Spotify, or you can head over to the aforementioned Free Relief Golf Podcast Patreon platform, which still rolls off the tongue. There you can give as little or as much support as you wish through the multiple tiers that I've set up. Each tier yields different levels of access to my personal golf in progress and tournament results through the 2022 season. I'll put the appropriate links in the episode description, So head on over if you'd like to follow me through, see, my personal golfing journey. Now the next time, it's not going to be for a little while. I will be continuing to document my golfing progress over on my subscription podcast, but in terms of big national events, the month of May continues to see a lull in the season for me. I'll be caddying in the St Andrews Lynx Trophy, and before then, the Scottish Amateur Open Stroke Play will be taking place at Cruden Bay. I personally will not be playing as it clashes with the new golf club club championship, but maybe I'll get in touch with someone new to hear how it went. Time will tell if that actually happens, but until then, I've been Freddie, you've been lovely, see you next time.